It's nice to be back. I mean, Google's one of my homes, and it feels really comfortable to be here. Um, We're hiring. <laughs> um, you know, when I, uh, I, I have to just acknowledge I have my publisher here, uh, Mark Tauber, who's the publisher of Harper One, which is one of the imprints of HarperCollins, and the best imprint. Because all those special books that you read, the sacred books, the books that had really deep meaning, they published them, and they're on their list. So then it's something to really think about. Uh, but, but I remember um, when I started writing this book, which was about 35 years ago, um, any number of times I stopped writing it, in part because it was so much about me. And uh, as Gandhi said, there becomes a moment when the self is too much with you, and you can't even abide it. So there's no way in the world that I would agree to have my photo on a book or to have my name on it. Here it is, my photo and my name. And a lot of the things about writing a book become weird when you're writing a memoir. But about a year ago, because of the vitriol, the anger, the hatred, the schism that has occurred in American politics. This book got changed for me because at its heart, it is a story of two miracles and it is a story of an amazing time. In the middle of the Cold War, when Russia and the United States had 40,000 nuclear weapons pointed at each other and instead we buried those hatchets, and we worked together to conquer one of the worst diseases in human history, a disease which had killed half a billion people in the 20th century. When I got the TED Prize, I had Larry and Sergey in the audience, and I said, in the year that they were born, which was pretty close to the summer of love, there were three million people who died of smallpox. So it's not like, it, it's not ancient history. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to spend about 15 minutes and give you a little story of what's in the book, uh, some of the pictures, and three pictures in particular that I didn't know when I was here working at Google existed, and I only found them using Google search. I have a friend, Ramdas. Some of you know who he is. And he went to the Costco in Maui. And this was before the book was out. And the book was there between Bruce Springsteen and Harry Potter, I thought that was a good omen. Um, Peter said, I caught some breaks. That is the understatement of my life. Um, in 1962, I was a uh, sophomore going into my junior year at University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And I saw a little note that Martin Luther King was going to be on campus. And it was just a tiny little mention in the Michigan Daily. And Martin Luther King wasn't famous yet. He hadn't won his Nobel Prize. There hadn't been the Mississippi summer. And I have no idea what made me get out, off my ass and go walk down to the hall that he was speaking and see him. And if, if you've ever been to Ann Arbor, you know that while in the rest of the world, rain comes vertically, in Ann Arbor, under certain atmospheric conditions, it goes horizontally. And you just can't walk into it. And it was that kind of a day. And very few people showed up for his talk. You can see all the empty seats. This is a Hill Auditorium that seated 4,000 people, and there were only a couple hundred of us. So what Martin Luther King said was, hey, listen, that means there'll be more of me to go around. You all come up on stage and sit with me. And we sat with him on that stage and in front of him for six hours. None of us were ever the same. We all went down to Mississippi, Alabama. We all joined an alphabet soup of activist groups, SNCC and CORE and NAACP, SDS. We were all changed. Because what he talked about was a world not just in which children would be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin, not just about the arc of the moral universe that not bends towards justice on its own, but you got to jump up and grab that arc and pull it down and twist it so there's something that you can do to make the world a better place. And none of us had ever heard that before. I had never heard that before. 
I had never heard anybody talk about the long sweep of history and being able to enter into it and do anything good. Nobody had ever told me that any of us could do that. So that changed me. And, and, and by the way, I would not know that that photo existed if it hadn't been for Google. Because when I would tell this story before, people said, well, Martin Luther King never was at Michigan. And there was no record that he was there. And uh, when I went over to Skoll Global Threats Fund, Jeff Skoll said to me, you're not making this shit up, are you? <laughs> he said that about a lot of things. And I, I said, well, let's look. And we found the Bentley Historical Museum at the University of Michigan had just gone online. And this photo was just available for the first time of Martin Luther King going to Michigan. So um, I was in many ways a conventional kid. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. There were a couple things that were not conventional about my wife and I. Um, I, I it does bother me that that's the picture she keeps of me, <laughs> hidden behind, <laughs> hidden behind uh, the peace symbol. But we were activists by then. Uh, those of you who think that's a Mercedes symbol, it's almost the same thing, <laughs> but very different. And then uh, I became a real activist, and I went to medical school, and I got on a white coat with an ostentatious stethoscope dangling out of my side. I used to march with Martin Luther King and with the activists. I was arrested with Martin Luther King in Chicago. It's one of the biggest pride moments of my life. Um, those of you who are considering getting arrested for civil disobedience, I want you to know I learned an important lesson. Always get arrested with several hundred of your best friends. Because if you're all arrested at the same time, they put you in pretend jail, and you can bring guitars. <laughs> uh, the American Medical Association in those days said that health care was uh, not a human right, but it was a privilege for those who could afford it. We said that it was a human right. As a consequence, we were radicals. I came to San Francisco and did my internship. This, um, which I also had never seen until I Googled it, this uh, cover of Medical World News showed up, uh, and they made copies of it and put it all over the hospital for my first day. And uh, they put a, a bullseye around my face with a hypodermic needle in my nose, and it said, Presbyterian Hospital welcomes its new young radical doctor. Radical in those days meant that you were Bernie Sanders. And then uh, while I was uh, in San Francisco, all of you are too young to know this, but in 1970, a group of Native Americans took over Alcatraz because the Treaty of Laramie said that any surplus land that was declared surplus that had been taken from the Indians would go back to the Indians. Long story short, uh, a woman named Lou Trudell wanted to deliver her baby on Indian liberated land. And there was no water. There was no electricity. There was no medicine. And there was a Coast Guard embargo around the island. And uh, the newspapers started saying, is there no doctor? Is there no doctor anywhere in the area willing to go there? And I thought that was an ad. Larry, come to Alcatraz. So I lived on Alcatraz. And I delivered uh, this baby named Wavoka. If you know Indian history, Wavoka was the founder of the ghost dance religion. And I could not prove to anybody that I was on Alcatraz, except I was able to Google everything I could find. And I found that picture of me on Alcatraz. Um, when I came off the island, it seemed like uh, every television camera in the world was waiting for me when I came off on a Coast Guard boat. And they put it, their camera in my face, and they said, what do the Indians want? And I had never met a Native American before I went on the island. And we, in Detroit, we don't have a lot. And uh, I didn't have an answer. But Warner Brothers saw me on television and offered me a, um, a job uh, playing a young doctor in a movie they were making, and also being the doctor for the rock concerts that the movie was about. So it was the Jefferson Airplane, The Grateful Dead, Jethro Tull. We ended up with a concert for Pink Floyd in Canterbury in England, and I was the doc for that. Uh, my first day on the movie caravan, I met this guy. And um, I, I knew there was something different about him, because when he smiled, he, all of his teeth were a rainbow. He had got a, a dentist to put in a Vibgior, violet, indigo, blue, red, you know. You know and, when he's, and he had a, a, a duck bill hat on made of a real duck's bill. I knew there was something different about wavy gravy. And I, I'm proud to tell you that over the last 40 years, he's become my best friend. Wavy, of course, is known for being the master of ceremonies at Woodstock, 
where he's the one who said, what I have in mind is breakfast in bed for 400,000. He and his friends caravaned across Europe and Asia, providing relief and medical care. With every country that we went through, we used medicine and food and other aid. Everybody who was sick would come out. There'd be 70 people waiting to see Larry. And there was a feeling in the air. So I want to tell you two things about this. Uh, one is that we went to, uh, we lived in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iran, Iraq, India, Nepal, uh, with those buses. And uh, we would do medical care camps every place I went. And we had a little bit of medicine and a little bit of food. Every place we went, we were going to the smallest villages. And if it was a Hindu village, there would be a shrine to Lord Shiva or Ram. If it was a Buddhist village, there'd be a, an image of Buddha. If it was a Muslim village, there'd be a picture of, of Mecca. And not every time, but maybe three out of 10 times, right next to that image in the holiest part of the village, there would be a picture of John F. Kennedy, President of the United States, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Pakistan. And it's going to be a long time before there'll be a picture of an American president in a special place, in a village, anywhere in the world. And w one of the things that I realized as I wrote this book, I want to tell you a story that will motivate you to believe that we can make the world, again, the kind of place where people all over the world will feel about America as we felt then. We were the good guys. Now, let's not kid ourselves. A lot of it was aspirational. But we need that aspiration, and we need to have it again. And we've done it before, and we can do it again. And I'll tell you, I was invited to, this is my wife. We've been married 47 years. That was our psychedelic bus. Uh, I think I'm sm smoking some illicit substance there. Um, I was honored and invited to the Pentagon and given an award uh, and asked to speak to the 3.5 million soldiers and sailors and Marines we have and to talk in the Pentagon Auditorium to the Army brass to generals and admirals and assistant secretaries of defense. And I was talking about asymmetrical warfare and unconventional threats to na national security, cyber weapons and biological weapons, but also climate change and pandemics and things like that. And before I started my talk, and the auditorium was filled with people who I wouldn't normally have thought of that I'd be hanging out with when I looked like this. And so I showed this picture first. And I said, I think before I talk to you about threats to national security, you ought to see this picture. Now, there's only two possibilities. Either you know about this, or you don't know about this. If you know about this, good on you <laughs> that you still invited me. If you don't know about this, we got big problems. Because <laughs> you're the Pentagon. <laughs> Well, I went from uh, being a hippie. I had been a radical, then I became a hippie. Then I went to live in a monastery. And this is the ashram that I lived in. It's Kenshi. It's at the corner of India and Nepal and China. And this is my guru, Neem Karoli Baba. And he's reading a book about him. And I just had a chance, am I allowed to say, I just had a chance to see virtual reality of the Taj Mahal. And this is real reality of the Taj Mahal. This is my wife and I in 1973 in front of the Taj Mahal. And you know, there were no barriers then. We actually slept inside the tomb. We didn't know it was a tomb. We were idiots. Um, and this is a picture of my guru and myself uh, after I'd been living in that ashram for three years. You asked me to tell that story. I'll tell you the story uh, of what's happening here. He said to me, uh, everybody who comes here learns Hinduism and Buddhism and Jainism. We learn." Islam, we learn to read the Old Testament, the New Testament. And then we're taught to meditate, and we're taught to do service. And he said, Larry, he used to call me Dr. America. He said, Dr. America, I want you to do that too. But I want you to do something else. How much money do you have? And I said, wait a minute. I was a little confused. He said, and this is all in Hindi. He said, how much money do you have? I said, I have $500. He said, not here. You're lying. <laughs> How much money do you have back in America? I said, well, I have $500 back in America, too. And he said, $500 here, $500 there. That's all you have? 
you are no doctor, which is what my mother said to me. <laughs> you know, all you have is 500 bucks, you're no doctor. <laughs> but he said all this in Hindi. And he said, you are no doctor. Dr. America, you are no doctor. You are no doctor. Tumto Dr. Nahin, tumto Dr. Nahin. Kept saying it over again. Then he switched to English. And he said, you are no doctor. You are no doctor. You N O doctor. United Nations organization. Dr. America is going to become United Nations doctor. You're going to go to villages. You're going to give vaccinations. There's a war against this disease called smallpox. It's going to be eradicated on Mullen, pulled out by the roots. This is God's gift to humanity. Get out of here. Go. And he sent me down to the World Health Organization, which was a, a bus, a drive, a car, a, a train, maybe 17 hours away. And I walked in there, and they said, what are you doing here? I looked like, I mean, I had a dress on, and I had a beard down to the middle of my back. I, they said, what are you doing here? I said, well, my guru who lives in the Himalayas says that I'm supposed to come work for the United Nations because God's gift to humanity is that we're going to eradicate smallpox. And I was there for about 30 seconds the first time. And I went back up to the ashram, and he said, did you get your job? And I said, you know, go back down. And that went on 10, 15 times. And each time I got a little smarter, I trimmed my hair a little bit and cut my beard a bit and put on a jacket. And um, after a while, I understood there was no smallpox program. Mrs. Gandhi, who was then the prime minister, I think correctly said that India had other problems, poverty and diarrheal deaths and pneumonia. Um, and I felt kind of silly every time coming in and being rebuffed uh, and going back to the ashram and my guru saying, this is your destiny. And it, nothing was feeling right to me. And I walked in, and one day he said, right now, go immediately. So I took a train, I went in there, I walked in. And for the first time in six months of going back and forth, what I walked in, it was another American. And he said, who are you? And I said, hi, my name is Larry Brilliant. I'm a doctor. <laughs> I live in the Himalayas. My guru said, this small I'm supposed to work for the smallpox program. God is going to help eradicate smallpox. Who are you? He said, oh, I'm the head of the smallpox program from Geneva. <laughs> I'm just here trying to talk Mrs. Gandhi into letting us have a smallpox program. We don't have one yet. Um, but should I interview you just in case we do? And that was D.A. Henderson who uh, died about four weeks ago. And I'm going to go to his funeral in two weeks. Uh, he was the head of the global program. And after I had worked in that program for 10 years, and I was running the program in New Delhi, uh, he sent me to back to close down the program after we'd eradicated smallpox and to put all the records together and to microfilm them. And I found his interview that he did with me. And he said, I have today interviewed a young man, he's American, his name is Larry Brown. He says he's a doctor, does not look like one. <laughs> he appears to have gone native. <laughs> and I treasure that. And this book is the first book I've ever written about smallpox that D.A. Henderson did not edit every page, every word. Every... So, okay, so here's my transformation from being a radical to being a hippie to being a mystic to being a UN officer. And that was my boss, Nicole Grasset, a French doctor who, she won the Legion of Honor. In fact, all the people that I work with, D.A. Henderson and Bill Feige won the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Isao Arita won the Japan Prize. M.I.D. Sharma, Muni Inderdev Sharma, won Padma Shri and Padma Bhushan for the Indians here. You know what that means. And we went door to door trying to find every case of smallpox in the world at the same time and put a ring of immunity around it. Because that was the only way that you could stop smallpox, which had so many different names, you couldn't actually say the name. Uh, how many of you speak Bengali? Bashanto is spring sickness, and Shitlama, cooling mother. Um, and so we showed that little card, and we found cases of smallpox. Now, th this is the part I apologize for. I'm going to show you three pictures of smallpox. And I've chosen ones that are not particularly terrifying, but they will still be terrifying because it was the worst disease in the world. Uh, this is a young boy in South India. This woman died of hemorrhagic smallpox, a particularly cruel form of smallpox, 100% fatal, 
ordinary smallpox was only one third fatal. And here's the computation that over 200 million deaths in this last century, more than all the genocides and world wars. And here's really an important slide. This is my favorite slide in public health. It's all the kings and queens and emperors who died of smallpox. And it's not my favorite slide because I particularly want to kill off kings and queens. But it applies to the heads of all the great technology companies and all the CEOs and startups and the Medici's in this world we live in now in, in Silicon Valley. Because it doesn't help you to be in the 1% or the one quarter of 1% or the 1% of 1%. If there's a virus that has no antiviral and no vaccine, you will die. And these are the most powerful people in the world, and they died of smallpox. It's just a reminder that we're all in it together. And I'm not going to go through all the rest of the history of smallpox with you this time. It's in the book. I've never had a chance to say that before. But I will show you a picture of the fellow, this wonderful man, Bill Fagey, who created the strategy that we used. And I, um, I tell you about Bill because his father was a Lutheran minister. His grandfather was a Lutheran minister. And I've used this slide set to talk about compassion. And Bill is the most compassionate person I've ever met. He was the head of CDC, the head of the Carter Center. He's rumored to have whispered into Bill Gates' ear, it might be a good idea to start a foundation. He's an amazing person. He says that countries should be judged not by their GDP or by their wealth, but how they treat people who don't look like the leaders who don't have the same color, don't speak the same language, don't have the same religion, aren't living in the same town. We should judge civilizations and histories by the compassion they show to those who are most different than the rulers. And, and not just different now, but far away. Do, can we look at a child in Aleppo who has been bombed and is dying in Syria and have as much compassion for that child as we would for our neighbor. And not just today can we think about the children, the grandchildren, and the great-grandchildren who will be affected by climate change, by an invisible, odorless, tasteless gas that's going to destroy their world. Do we have compassion going forward and backwards? Do we have, do we have compassion for our ancestors and our traditions? He's a great man, Bill Fagey. And I think that I will stop there. Um, and thank you very much. And then Peter and I are going to talk about it. Thank you very much. I'm going to take my privilege to ask a couple of questions, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. So uh, one is, you know, you went door to door giving vaccinations when you wanted to communicate someplace else. It could take days to set up communication. Now that we have uh, more communication technology, what could you do differently today? And, and what are the targets that we could eradicate or? or... Yeah, I think it's a great What's question. Uh, I'm, I'm often asked to compare the eradication of polio with the eradication of smallpox. Um, because, of course, w we didn't even have telegrams. We had telex machines and uh, no personal computers, no computers. No cell phones, no phones. If you wanted to make a long distance call from Calcutta to New Delhi, you had to book it two days in advance. And if you wanted to call from Delhi to uh, Geneva, you had to send a telex. I mean, um, so we didn't have that. We didn't have photocopy machines. Um, but we had an incredible will to eradicate. And smallpox, because on its face, it's so horrible. It helps to generate a will to conquer it. Polio, on the other hand, you can't see it. Uh, unless somebody is actually paralyzed, you don't know it. It's, it, it. it's in the feces and in the water. Only one out of 1,000 kids who get polio actually have any physical symptoms. So it's hard to develop that will. So the polio campaign, which is so close to eradicating, there have only been 17 cases of polio in Pakistan, seven cases in Afghanistan, two or three in Nigeria all year. I mean, we are really that close. Uh, they've had all the technology, and they've really done, and on the genomics, some incredible uh, advances in genomic technology and being able to do all the communications. If we had had that in smallpox, um, 
we probably could have cut the time that it took us to eradicate in half. Uh, smallpox eradication cost $150 million in 1967 dollars. You know, call it a billion. We reap those benefits every week in the world, not just from the lack of suffering and the lack of disease, but even in the little yellow cards we used to have to carry going across airports. I think polio eradication has already cost about $10 billion. So having the technology alone is not enough. I'll just say one more thing about medical technology. We had a vaccine against smallpox for 100 years before we were able to eradicate smallpox. We've had a vaccine against polio for 60 years. It takes people more than technology. I'm here at Google. This may be a surprise. It takes people more than technology. It, the, the technological advances in medicine, whether an antiviral or antibiotic or a vaccine, they are the condition precedent that allows you to think about conquering a disease. But in many ways, they're just the beginning. Okay. And then uh, one more question. So uh, I was an office mate with uh, Meng for a while in the, in the early days, and we worked together. And, and through him and others, you know, I've worked on my mindfulness and compassion and serenity, and I keep working at it. And, I think I'm making some progress, but I've never ever achieved this kind of spiritual enlightenment that uh, you talk about. And I think you were maybe a little bit skeptical at first, but you got there. So what am I missing? Is it the guru? Is it the drugs? Uh... So, so is there anybody in this room that has not had that question? <laughs> uh, I don't mean about the drugs. Um, you know, you said it earlier. You said that I got lucky. I, I feel that way. I mean, I, I, I met a, uh, a teacher who was still alive. We only had three years before he died, but we had, we had that. Um, and when I sat in front of him, uh, I remember the first time. I, I mean, I was really skeptical. I mean, uh, a kid from a, a Jewish tradition in Detroit, Michigan, going into an ashram filled with idols touching the feet of the guru. I mean, these were all things I was trained. That's the last thing you ever do. I was waiting for a, a golden calf to come out and march across the Cecil B. DeMille screen, you know? Um, I thought it was really weird. And, um, and then um, one day, uh, he held my hand for a second. And I could sense that he felt nothing but total love, not just for me, but for everybody in the world. And then, then this thing happened where my, my rational mind, I'm a scientist. Maybe I just play one on television, but I pretend to be a scientist. My rational mind couldn't figure out what was happening to me. I could accept that he loved everybody in the world, because that's his job. He's a guru. What I didn't understand is that in that moment, I loved everybody in the world. And I had never felt like that before. I mean, I gave a talk the other day, and I mentioned that my friend Ramdas has a, um, like a religious table on it, and he put a picture of Trump because he's trying to show love to somebody who otherwise he would not feel love for. And I think that's the thing, is that when you have that spiritual experience, we are really all one. And, and, and it's not just that we're 99.44% the same genetic material. It's that we really are all one. We cannot forget that diversity is not something that is thrust upon us. It is the biggest opportunity that's given to us. Because each one of us has a little bit of the secret. It's part of being a different person, a different culture, a different community, a different language. We all have a little bit of that secret, that little Harry Potter secret map in us. And that experience you come by, by luck as I did, by years of meditation, by childbirth, by knitting, by praying, by being in the monastery, by working in the street with kids, by feeling compassion towards your grandparents, I have met people who have had that experience in every way imaginable. 
There's no one way that is the same for each of us. We've all got our own little map that's been given to us, our own religion, whatever it is, is our own, as they say in India, our own dharma, our own destiny. It's better for us, however humble, than somebody else's. And that, that's what I learned. I learned to respect every religion. I started studying all religions that I could. I started making pilgrimages to each religion. I, I started trying to meet people who were very different than me. And it all came out of that one experience. So, Peter, everybody who knows you knows you're not missing a damn thing. <laughs> you, you haven't. Nothing has eluded you. And I think everybody who knows you is privileged to know you. Thank you, Dr. America. Uh, <laughs> let's go to the audience questions. Anybody? Thank you. Uh, so question, uh, Larry, what do you think America could do to get to a place where other countries would feel that way about America again? And why did they have J JFK's picture in the first place? Um, oh, I think they had JFK's picture because, um, you know, everybody in those little villages either had a, an uncle or a cousin who had gone to New York or gone to school in America or, or wanted to, because uh, a lot of the myths that America's streets were covered with gold was part of it. But it always felt like America, after the Second World War, as a victorious and occupying power, was such a benevolent occupying power. We didn't take, we didn't take one acre of land in Germany. I mean, we just, um, it was our highest and our best moment, I think. And uh, this was not 20 years after the Second World War, when that glow of how well we had behaved as a victor. Um, uh, that's not to excuse a lot of the things that happened in war. But people saw us as um, the sole superpower. I mean, we were beginning this Cold War with the Soviet Union, but we were the, on our way to becoming the world policeman, but a good cop. And the world wanted that. I think we still want that. I think we still want a good cop. I want America to be powerful. I want our army and our navy to be powerful but only if we're going to be good cops. I don't want us to be powerful if we're going to be bad cops. I want us to be good cops and able to protect the uh, people who are trying to do good things. And why JFK's picture was there was because he represented that moment in America when it seemed that we were sort of like your rich uncle who you could depend on in an emergency, or at least you aspired to be able to depend on an emergency. And how we get back there, it's a long way. We've done a lot of things. It's a long way. Um, I think we're still the best country in the world, personally. But we don't live up to my expectations. I hope we don't live up to anybody's expectations. We need, we need to, to change and try and get better and stronger and, 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 and more loving. We, we need the kind of training that Peter's talking about. I grew up in India, and I can testify that I've seen pictures of JFK in all odd places, mm -hmm. usually with a flower garland and a red dot between his eyebrows. Mm -hmm. But my question was about the picture behind you, President Obama. And mm -hmm. it's no longer there, but yeah. um, he's in his last 100 days of his presidency, and I'm personally quite sad that that era is coming to an end. But I was wondering how, you would, how the world looks upon his legacy. I think the Nobel Pro Committee kind of jumped the gun. They jumped the gun, yeah. But I think I have one picture which has, uh, we have two people from Google in this picture. And uh, President Obama and this crazy guy over here. And this is the group of uh, Silicon Valley folks who, when Ebola happened in, um, in, in Africa, in West Africa, uh, we had a meeting of uh, Google and Facebook and Salesforce and Yahoo and Apple and every other technology company. And we, uh, I, I work at Skoll Global Threats Fund, where I'm the chairman. And we convened a meeting, uh, and all the tech companies jumped in to help President Obama to deliver America's best to stop the epidemic of Ebola. And then afterwards, he brought us all to the White House to thank us. And this is leadership at its best. 
we all jumped in. Paul Allen jumped in. Microsoft jumped in. It's not just Silicon Valley. <laughs> and we, uh, Salesforce built a, uh, a patient tracking system, and, and, and Google gave money and technology, and uh, Larry and Lucy Page gave money, and Zuckerberg gave money. Everybody did. It was a great. I don't have to take you back to the Cold War where Russians and Americans and 170 nations worked together. We can still do this stuff. And we did it because Obama called us to do it. We did it because that, that's what we're supposed to do. That's why we're doing what we're doing. We're not here just to write code. We're here because we think writing code will help make the world a better place. All of us, every one of us. We may forget that from time to time. But here, when children were dying and we were seeing these horrific pictures of Ebola, we were willing to jump in because we had the leadership and the means to do it. And we're going to be asked to do that more, all of us. And, and we're going to jump in and do it again. My question was slightly different, though. I was just wondering how do you think the world would look upon him you know, 10 years from now? Oh, I think his legacy, legacy is going to grow, and we're going to look back upon him as one of the greatest presidents in history. I think we're going to miss not only his intellect, but his demeanor. I think we're, did it, I don't know, this, this video will probably be seen 10 years from now, so this will not make any sense. But how many of you heard Michelle Obama's talk yesterday? I mean, hello. <laughs> Let's say we brought the you, just before you got your advice to basically eradicate smallpox, brought them into the future, and you were talking to the younger you. What would you say to him in terms of what he should be doing now? Don't be an asshole. <laughs> I mean, I was a jerk. Um, well, just before, you mean just before I was with Maharaji? No, by then, I, a lot of my jerkiness had been beaten out of me. <laughs> but certainly growing up, um, you know, uh, I, 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 I got to be sent to San Francisco in the middle of the summer of love when I was working for the Office of Equal Health Opportunity. I had a card that said civil rights specialist. And I got tossed into the summer of love. And uh, that's just not a fair thing to do to a young kid from Detroit, Michigan. I had no tools to resist. But, but before that, um, I don't think I was a very nice person. I don't think I was, uh, I don't think I ever thought about, you know, could I, if somebody was sick in front of me, could I help them? I didn't think about a war 10,000 miles away or being that. I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think you should feel bad if, you're only thinking about yourself and your career. That's the natural progression. It, it takes something that, um, that changes you to make you start thinking about bigger things. For me, it was my father and my grandfather dying, and I'm feeling sorry for myself. Meeting Martin Luther King, meeting Wavy and all these wonderful hippies in the 60s, which was such a, a great experience for me. Meeting Neem Karoli Baba, Bill Fagey. I got to meet all these great giants who really cared about the world. And they gradually whittled away my assholeness. <laughs> well, there's still a lot left. I'm really touched by the moment when you said you, when you touched the guru, you, you loved everyone. Do you carry that with you still? Yeah, pretty much. How I do mean, you keep it? Um, I try to keep it safe. I treasure it. Um, I try to nurture it. Uh, I was at a meeting on Friday uh, at Dreamforce, and the guy before me said, there's a Native American uh, explanation for that. And a young brave is asking his grandfather, how do I grow up to be wise and kind and compassionate? And the grandfather says, well, son, there are two wolves inside of you. And one of the wolves is an angry, howling beast who would rip your throat out if he could, who would take your money, who would take your children. And the other one of these wolves loves everybody in the world and is kind and would share everything. And they're battling. And the young man said, Grandfather, which wolf will win? And the grandfather said, well, obviously, the one that you feed. Thank you for being with us today, Peter and Larry. Thank you so much. Okay.